Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which is an introduction to Adam Matthew resources within the JISC Digital Archival Collections Group Purchasing Pilot. Today's session is in two parts. So later on, I'm going to briefly introduce the collections available in the two packages from Adam Matthew. That's Literature, Society and Performance and the History of Innovation and Discovery. I'm a content specialist. That's my background at the company. So it's going to be very content focused at that section. If you do want information on things like specific pricing for your institutions, then what I can do is send you the contact details of your institution's sales rep after the session and they'll be able to uh, give you some more details on that. We only have half an hour to run through all of the introductions today. So I'd encourage you to visit the JISC website and go to the pilot project page to find out a bit more about the session. And I can email a link to that page to all of you as well, along with the recording of the webinar. To begin today, I'd like to introduce Paola Marchioni, who is the head of digital resources for teaching, learning and research at JISC and is coordinating the purchase scheme. She's going to explain how the pilot works and the reasons why JISC created it. So over to you, Paola. OK, thank you, Ben. Um, I will give a brief introduction to the Digital Archival Collections Group Purchasing Pilot, which aims to support institutions with a more effective, uh, coordinated and transparent approach to the acquisition of digital archival collections. So what it is and why did we do it? The pilot leverages the collective purchasing power of institutions um, with the intention to widen access to digital archival collections across all institutions and across all the GISC bands. And it's based around a simple uh, principle. Uh, the more products are bought per publisher, the lower the price. So in this pilot, GISC uh, collaborated with three publishers, uh, other Matthew, Brill and ProQuest, which have a combined offer of uh, over 20 products. So why did we do it? Well, we know that these collections have a positive impact on supporting research, teaching and learning. JISC has done a number of studies in the past. Uh, the most recent one has been the impact of digital collections study. Uh, the URL is just here if you're interested in looking at it. Um, where libraries, researchers and teachers have told us that uh, they, they, these type of collections are an important complement to more traditional resources such as journals and books, especially in the arts, humanities and social sciences. However, budgets are stretched, um, especially at the moment the exchange rates is not very favourable and institutions find it difficult to purchase these um, often expensive uh, content resources. In addition, JISC is not in a position to continue uh, with what we used to do in the past um, with the national purchases, so purchasing collections on behalf of all our members. Um, so we really needed to think of alternative ways in which JISC could still support institutions in increasing access to these collections. Um, so we spoke to libraries and we tried to find out what the main barriers and problems were and how we could uh, we could help. So when we spoke to libraries, uh, the, 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 the requirements they expressed were um, to keep costs down, well, everybody wants to do that, um, to improve price transparency uh, for, for products, to tackle recurrent platform and hosting fees, which as you know, of course, can add up over the years um, to increase access across all institutions, all GISC bands, to test new approaches to licensing and purchasing content, and to have more information on products uh, expressed in a consistent manner across products and across uh, publishers. And I have to say this pilot, this purchasing pilot, is part of a bigger piece of work that JISC is doing on um, supporting institutions with improving um, acquisition of digital archival collections. And again, the URL is here if you are um, interested in looking at it. So with this in mind, um, the characteristics of the group purchasing pilot 
are that so the key elements are that um, as I said there are over for this pilot there are over 20 products on offer from three publishers um, other Matthew has six collections and it's very much based on a pick and mix approach because we know that libraries have told us that uh, they all want different they're all in, interested in different products so many institutions are interested in, in many different products all the products, uh, the more products are bought across the institutions per publisher, the lower the price and there are different discount um, levels and different trigger points. All prices are openly available uh, by GISC Band on the GISC Collections website. They all include a one-off platform fees. So for these collections, the publishers have committed that there will not be any annual recurrent um, costs. Institutions can pledge their interest until mid-July. After that, the final price will be um, decided uh, based on how many products have been pledged for and publishers will invoice institutions. Now, if institutions need to be invoiced earlier that that can be done and all publishers have agreed that they would credit institutions if the price went uh, went down um, uh, by mid-July and of course it, it's also governed by a GIST collections license. So if we go to uh, the other Matthew Digital um, uh, page on the GIST collections website you can uh, see that um, there will be in the overview tab all the information about the six collections on offer and then in the full description tab some more details of the characteristics of the pilots that I've just mentioned. So the one of uh, perpetual purchase, the, um, uh, the, about the hosting fees, the various discount uh, percentages and trigger points and the form that we ask you to use to express interest in given products. Um, you can also do this with the publishers directly. We're actually rethinking whether we, we need that extra step or not. So this is all about the pilot. Um, the last thing I want to say is that this is uh, very much a pilot project. So at GISC we're very interested in any feedback that you might have about it. So if you do have any feedback um, I'm happy to be contacted by email um, uh, whether you like some uh, elements whether you think it's useful or whether it doesn't work at all for you okay thank you very much from me and I'll hand over back to Ben thank you very much for that Paola that was a really good introduction to the scheme okay so I just wanted to give a quick overview of the packages available uh, from Adam Matthew as part of the pilot. Each collection I'm about to describe can be purchased either individually or as part of the full package. Um, and then we'll take questions on this and if you have any questions for Paola as well, we can do those at the end. So the first package is literature, society and performance. And this is made up of three collections, Shakespeare in performance, prompt books from the Folger Shakespeare Library, Romanticism, Life, Literature and Landscape, and 18th Century Drama. So starting with Shakespeare in Performance, we worked with the Folger Shakespeare Library to digitise their collection of rare and unique prompt books. These are documents that contain the text of the play to be performed, along with notes and annotations for everyone who was involved. So this is from the actors and stage managers to directors and prompters. Each document therefore tells the story of how a particular performance was intended to be staged, while together they offer an unparalleled insight into how performances of Shakespeare's plays have changed over time. This view of changing interpretations extends from actors' lines and deliveries to music and lighting, and spans the 17th to the 20th centuries. So you can choose to view the documents um, either by the play that you're interested in or by the document type. So say you're interested in Hamlet. Here we have a list of all the documents that relate to Hamlet in the collection. And you'll notice that there is supplementary material alongside the core prompt book collection. So letters, illustrations, that sort of thing. We can choose, however, to filter by prompt book.
and then we've got a more refined list and if we click onto one of these documents you can see what our document landing page looks like so you have the thumbnails uh, of the document images at the top then any metadata that we have collected for the documents uh, can be seen here this is all fully searchable and any printed text in the document is also fully searchable and then we have uh, act and scene headings here so we can go and have a look for example at act one scene two here you will see our image viewer we can make this full screen as well and so you can clearly see some of the handwritten annotations and changes made to the text now if we just go back to the document details briefly I wanted to show a special feature of this collection which is this compare feature so if you go to this one you can choose another prompt book again Hamlet click go and what this is going to allow is detailed instant comparison between two different interpretations of the play so we have our original one that we were looking at on the left and then our comparison text on the right each of these can be controlled individually but what we can also do is control the two together with these joint controls at the top so we can go to Act 1, Scene 2 and we can see that some of the annotations that were made in our original text uh, in manuscript form have actually been transferred in text form to the uh, text of the second version if we go on to the next page we can compare instructions given to the actors and stage managers uh, in the notes for each performance so that's just a, a special feature of the Shakespeare in performance documents that I wanted to highlight. Now Romanticism, which is the second collection within this first package, this is a collection uh, that includes working notebooks, verse manuscripts and correspondence of William Wordsworth and his contemporary writers, all digitized in full color so the personal correspondence shows the network of contemporary artists and writers how they influenced each other and then annotated versions of famous works offer the chance for deep analysis of their output and then finally research and teaching is further enhanced by the inclusion of diaries travel journals scrapbooks um, autograph books financial records another strength of the collection is the visual galleries we go to this one so the romantic movement um, was tied in with interpretations of landscape and the reflection of the world in art and so the collection seeks to link this side of the movement with the literary output by including images of romantic artwork so here for example we have a painting uh, by Seaton of Oldswater which was um, a landscape that inspired Wordsworth's I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud and you'll find several depictions of um, this particular lake and the Lake District more generally within the collection moving on to 18th century drama so this is the last collection within this package the collection spans the years 1737 to 1824 and it's built around the John Larpent plays which were sourced from the Huntington Library so John Larpent was the English inspector of plays from 1778 to 1824 and that meant that he was responsible for approving plays before they could be staged so what the collection is um, is a set of works preserved from original license submissions so that's over two and a half thousand uh, plays digitized in this collection and some of them were approved, some of them were approved once changes were made, some were rejected and you then get later versions uh, coming through 
And these documents are then supplemented by further material. So that includes the diaries of John's professional collaborator and wife, Anna. Now, as well as the documents, I'd like to mention the London stage feature. Now, the London stage is a reference work that lists every known theatrical performance made in London between 1660 and 1800. And our collection includes digital copies of this book, but also an interactive database that allows advanced searching of the entries, uh, as well as data association and visualization features. So just a very quick demo of some of these features here. So here we have our searchable version of the London stage in database form. So say we're interested in Hamlet, but uh, we are only interested in it between a certain number of years. So say 1719 through to 1764. And perhaps you're researching a particular theatre as well. Um, so to pick out one of the better known ones here. Uh, let's have a look at Covent Garden. Then click search. So in this time period, there were 92 performances of Hamlet at the Covent Garden Theatre, and you get every single one listed uh, with any additional information that there is on that particular performance. And you can also filter this further. So say you're interested in a particular actor who was performing if you click on the name, the database automatically refines. So now we're seeing just the eight um, performances at Covent Garden of Hamlet in this date range where Quinn was one of the performers. Now what turning this into a database has allowed us to do is also um, play around with how some of these features, oh sorry, some of the uh, actors and theatres uh, and works performed were connected to each other. So that's what you get from this data associations tool. So if you're interested in the theatre Royal Drury Lane, you can click on that. And then what you'll see on the right side is every role that was performed at the theatre Royal Drury Lane during um, the time span of 1660 to 1800. And you'll also see all the actors who performed there. Uh, the works that were performed and the years in which the most works were performed. So just taking the actors as an example, what this tells us is that Palmer appeared 4,852 times um, at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. That was out of a total of 6,715 performances. Um, and then what this uh, purple shading does is gives you an indication of how frequently the two occurred with each other. So people like um, Palmer, Packer, Burton uh, have quite dark purple shading because they are heavily associated. Most of their performances were at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Whereas if you're looking um, maybe at some of the roles that were performed there, Harlequin, a very popular role all round at this time, isn't as closely associated just with this theatre. So that's really a tool to kind of have a look at what was being performed where and who was performing it. And then just to round this very brief introduction off, um, we do have some data visualizations as well. So this is a set of graphs that again take the same data and look at performances per year, working actors, uh, the number of active theatres, the number of performances and the most performed works. And you'll be able to kind of play around with this um, or researchers and students can have a look at patterns over time at individual theatres. So that's 18th century drama. And that kind of is a very, very brief overview of the uh, collections that are available um, through that first package. And hopefully it's also given a sense of how we like to display the documents, how we like to create additional features to aid teaching and research, how we like to add context to the core material in the collections. 
So the same is true for the second package, which is this history of innovation and discovery. So let's look first at Empire Online. So it has documents from the late 15th century to the early 21st and charts the history of modern empires, looking at themes of colonization and decolonization, missionaries, slavery, travel and travel writing, religion, race, class, and imperialism. Now you'll see from the introductory pages that this collection has been put together from material housed at many different global archives. There are documents such as exploration journals and logs. There are letter books and correspondence. Uh, there's periodicals, diaries, official government papers, missionary papers, travel writing, slave papers, children's adventure stories and traditional folk tales. All of which is aimed at giving a really well-rounded view of empire. And as I mentioned, we like to include additional features in the collections that add background and context to the documents. So all of our collections have essays written by leading academics on the subjects covered, and Empire Online is no different. Here you can see the essays. And if we click into one of these, what you'll find is that the text of the essay is hyperlinked to documents within the resource that provide evidence for the points being made. So in this way, students have a means of reading some background information while also being encouraged to explore the primary material itself. And again, these links are all uh, added in by leading academics who, who produce the essays in the first place. So we can click on this link and it will take us to the document in the same collection. Here we have the usual landing page with the metadata and uh, images at the top. Now the essay and document I selected are about the Great Exhibition of 1851 and that leads us quite nicely onto our next collection which is World's Fairs, A Global History of Expositions. So the Great Exhibition is a nice connecting theme because innovation and discovery that came with imperial ambitions and competitive nationalism were channeled into the fair. And this demonstration of innovation, discovery and technology is a theme that runs throughout the material digitized in the World's Fairs collection. It's also a great resource for students studying imperialism, race relations, gender studies, consumer culture, architecture, and design. And it has content from hosting and participating countries from every continent, um, a date range focused on 1851 to 1967, but some material from outside that range. And while over 200 fairs are represented in the collection, there are nine that we have picked out as case studies. These have more material associated with them in the collection and they were selected for being particularly prominent or influential on the advice of our consultant academic editors. So here you can see the list of them. And this page gives you an introduction to the case study fairs and then what you can do is click to explore documents related to them. Now you'll see that the material is really varied. Uh, we've got statistics, flyers, pamphlets, adverts, speeches, objects. There's official reports and planning documents, uh, photographs, maps, catalogues, much more. And fairs were a chance for corporations to make a statement about innovation as well as countries. So just looking at this uh, official view book from Chicago 33. Here we have um, the Chrysler building on the left and the General Motors building on the right from that fair. 
So motor companies invested very heavily in their exhibits at mid 20th century fairs. And so along with Ford, these companies really put a lot of money into some of the most popular exhibits, um, not just at Chicago, but also at later New York fairs as well. So this is as much about commercial innovation uh, as it is about international discovery. Now, if it's commercial innovation that you are um, interested in, then global commodities, trade, exploration and cultural exchange will also have much to offer. This is something of a sister collection to Empire. The collection is built around the production, trade and consumption of 15 major commodities throughout the modern age. You can see on this page the commodities that are covered. As with the other collections in this package, the material has been sourced from many global archives. And together, the documents allow users to explore themes of exploration and discovery, imperialism and attempts at monopoly, trade wars, translocation, um, economic geography, uh, slavery, mass production, luxury, taste, the evolution of global branding. There really is a, a huge variety of topics covered. And this is actually another collection where I'd really like to um, highlight some of the additional features just for the end of this webinar. So we have uh, price data visualizations. These show the changing cost of commodities over time and space, and they represent decades of research. So a whole range of commodities covered in there. Meanwhile, the energy data visualizations provide interactive data on oil, on gas, coal, renewables, uh, and indeed kind of total consumption and production across the world. So just to give a very quick demonstration, if you were interested in um, the production of oil across a time span, you can select that. You can uh, choose, we're looking at the top 20 oil producers. And then as you go through, you'll see the, uh, the bar chart updating depending on uh, the output of different countries. And then what you get in the bottom right is just a little bit of blab about what's going on at the time that might be contributing um, towards fluctuations in uh, energy production and consumption. So as much as I'd love to kind of carry on playing with some of the additional features or showing you some more documents, I don't want to take up too much of your time today and I know there might be questions. So I'll wrap up the introduction. It was a very brief overview of the six collections that are available and the two packages that they've been put into. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box and please remember to go to the GISC website for full details of what is available and the pricing information. And if we don't have any questions, then it just remains for me to say a massive thank you to Paola for introducing the scheme and for all her hard work putting it together. And thank you to everyone who's attended this afternoon. I hope you found it a useful introduction.